1941, the exile of the Liangs entered its fourth year. They followed several academic institutions of the nationalist government to the village of Lijuang on the upper reaches of the Yangtze River. The war seemed endless, and they stayed in this remote village for five years. In Lijuang, Lin Huiyin soon contracted pneumonia and was confined to bed. The last researcher to be hired by the institute while in Lijuang was Lo Zhiwen, a 16-year-old who had just graduated from middle school. Today,十二个钟头,是我十二个客人。每一个来了,又走了。最后,夕阳拖着影子,也走了。我没有时间盘问我自己胸怀。黄昏,却捏着脚,好奇地偷着进来。我说,朋友,这次我可不对你诉说
he just took a pair of scissors to remove a piece of rotted flesh and poured iodine tincture into the wound. It hurt so bad that I saw stars before my eyes, but I didn't utter a word. He said, good boy. During the war, Liang Sichung doctored his son and wife in this way. Our two children very often look like slum kids in Dickens stories. His legs are so beaten and scarred that they don't look like legs at all. The museum in Lichuang has kept a painting Liang Sichung gave his children that year. From the window of Long Tochun to the doorway of Lichuang. May we be able to have a bowl like this after the victory. Wilma Fairbank received this letter from Li Zhuang and learned about the condition the Liangs were living in. The paper is of all shapes and sizes, much of it thin, yellow, and decaying, the kind that might have wrapped bits of meat or vegetables brought back from the market. But all have in common that every inch is used, no empty space is afforded for margins or paragraphs, and the final page is often only a half or a third of a page, the rest cut off for other use. Then the number of stamps on the surviving envelopes makes one understand how costly correspondence. At the end of 1940, another scholar of the Institute of History and Philology came to Li Zhuang, the younger brother of Liang Sichung, archaeologist Liang Ziyong. Two great findings in the history of Chinese archaeology were made by Liang Ziyong. He took part in the excavation of the capital of Yin soon after graduating from Harvard and established the Chinese system of fieldwork in archaeology. Harsh outdoor conditions during the excavations inflicted upon him pulmonary disease. After he moved to Lichuang, all of his reports were completed from his sickbed. It was hard to survive in Lichuang, even more so with all the illnesses. Yun Huiyin and Liang Ziyong both contracted tuberculosis. The Liangs were struggling. In 1942, the chairman of the Institute for History and Philology wrote a letter to the then acting dean of Academia Seneca, asking him to authorize funds to provide special assistance. Dear Jia Hua, I write about the matter of Liang Sicheng and Liang Siyong the sons of Liang Chichao. Chichao left no material wealth, and his sons traveled thousands of miles in the provinces of Hunan, Guilin, Yunnan, and Sichuan, to the point of having nothing to eat and contracting serious illnesses. Would you inquire if Mr. Chen Boulay could support them? These descendants of Liang Chichao enjoy great academic repute both in China and abroad, but have now been confined here by illness. Normally, I don't approve of such things, but with the country and these people in particular in such a state today, please consider using your power to help them. Above all, don't tell others that the idea came from me. What do you think? After four months, the chairman of the Committee for Economic Resources of the Nationalist Government replied, our esteemed general grants medical and academic funding of 20,000 yuan to the Liang brothers. He ordered me to transfer the money to you. Min Huiyin had mixed feelings upon hearing about this matter. Dear Sir, I was greatly surprised to receive the letter from the government, and I was both moved and ashamed as I read it. Today, many commoners like ourselves are in a forest exile. The Liang brothers received your assistance in many forms for years, and yet we are ashamed as we have made no contribution to the war effort that only burdened our friends and society. For my three decades of life, I barely consumed food 
and given nothing. My life remains an empty check that cannot be cashed. With anxiety, I waited till the children grew up a little. Then the war came, and I had to struggle for survival. Recently, I have been desperate in my illness, undermined both physically and intellectually. I fear I might abuse your goodwill and fail you in the future. I am so ashamed. Li Zhuang, 1942. Fu Sunyan sent relief to the Liang brothers in their illness and destitution. In July 1941, half a year after moving to Li Zhuang, their dear friend, Lu Jin, came to Li Zhuang from Kunming for his annual vacation. Tian 这实在不是一个能让婚姻恢复健康的地方。Lao Jin's arrival brought warmth to the cold and damp courtyard. In his letter to John Fairbank, this logician said, I am entirely lost when detached from the Liangs. His life was closely tied to theirs. Another important mission in Li Zhuang was to finish his book, A Theory of Knowledge, the handwritten manuscript of which had been destroyed in an air raid. Tao 烤面包修炉灶与煤块做着各种家务买一些粗米杂粮糊口，过着现代工作。Tending his sick wife and young children, Liang Sicheng began writing a book that he had long considered, The Architectural History of China. The seed had been planted when he was studying in the United States, and his father sent him the mysterious book, building standards. After beginning his research in the institute and undertaking numerous research expeditions, the structure of architectural history of China began to take form in his mind. The previous year, the archives of ancient buildings in Tianjin had suffered flooding, but under the guidance of Chairman Zhu Chijian, these valuable manuscripts had been slowly dried out, copied, and sent to Li Jiang. In 1942, Liang started writing The Architectural History of China. So, he had the only 
，就是有一盏煤油灯。说这是人生的一大享受，听音乐、画佛像，这是人生的一大享受。这个时候呢，经过从三一年到四零年这个研究，他们积累了多少资料了？积累了近乎两百多个县、两千多个建筑、古建筑单元的资料，他们觉得可以来做进行系统的整理、综合的研究。The book rests on a decade of study of historical documents and field work by the Institute for Research on Chinese Architecture. It offered a concise narrative of the architectural history of China, examined the stylistic characteristics of each era, and analyzed the transition periods and explored the provenance of the structures. In 1943, as Liang Sicheng was writing Architectural History of China, he was commissioned by the Education Committee to write the Sculptural History of China, at the same time, he cooperated with Mo Zhongjiang on the images for the English version in the hope that this work could be ready for the world after the war. Now, Wilma, we are so happy to hear that your paper on Wu Liangzi came out an artistic success. We are also beginning to dig into Han tombs in Sichuan, where they are found in great numbers in almost any district. Wilma was very fond of ancient Chinese art and carefully collected rubbings of stone carvings in the Han Dynasty temple Wu Liangse in Shandong. After arranging these materials, she published an essay about them in the Harvard Journal of Asiatic Studies and the last excavation led by the Institute in the Southwest unearthed a large number of Han tombs, watchtowers, and cliff carvings that provided ample historical material for Liang as he wrote The Architectural History of China. So my mother, she thought that she could do some work in the material, and help my father do some work. 所以他就到这个十一所借了很多《史记》啊，《汉书》的回家来看。Phyllis is especially interested in your interest in Han tombs and the rubbings combined. Perhaps you do not yet know that she herself has wandered into the Han period. Very privately, with great diligence, she made acquaintances with the prominent Han characters, emperors and empresses, generals and ministers, their favorites and their enemies, so much so that she talked about them like her best friend living next door. Moreover, she links them up, their customs, costumes, architectures and even temperaments. If she keeps on in this rate, she will become an unusually well-informed young lady on Han. Huiying is a complete immersion in Han culture. Whenever you talk to her about anything, she will immediately go back to the old Han period. And when she comes to the world of our eyes, we have never doubted her beauty and beauty. Now,我们只能希望当他的灵魂偶尔飘荡回二十世纪的时候，能给我们带回一些惊人消息。Lin Huiyin wrote a letter to the Fairbanks in which she likened her husband to New York's Grand Central Station, 
herself to the station manager, and Lao Jin to a passenger who always came and went. Slow tempt and always prefers to handle any work one item at a time. Sichuan is least capable of taking care of household odds and ends. And odds and ends galore, rushing at him like different train pulling into Grand Central at any time. I am still the station master, of course, though he may be the station. I might be run over, but he can never be. Lao Qin is that sort of visitor who is either seeing people off or meeting someone at the train, slightly disturbing to the traffic, but make the station a little more interesting place and the station master a little more excitable. One day in 1941, the drone of airplanes sounded above the remote village of Lijuang. I remember you asked me in one of your letters whether we are remote from war since we moved to Lijuang. You can tell from what I have just described that none of us can ever be remote from war at any point in China today. We know we have all the sympathies and are given some help. But these were either too far-fetched or slow in coming, viewed from some practical angle. If America banned the exportation of oil to Japan a year or even a few months back, would Japanese bombers still be raiding our city so intensely these days and nights? As the war reached its fourth year, battlefields in Europe were covered with gun smoke. Even the United States, which had maintained neutrality, began to realize it might be drawn into the war at any time. That summer, the United States began to create a global organization for gathering secret intelligence. A number of scholars with experience in the Far East were invited to Washington, including John Fairbank, then teaching in the history department of Harvard University. Four months before Pearl Harbor, I was recruited to join the buildup of academic resources being converted to war purposes under the U.S. government. Only a few months after this organization had been set up, Pearl Harbor was attacked and the United States declared war on Japan. But once uh, the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor, um, the Americans became a full-time ally, of course, of the Chinese. And uh, they sent a full mission over to Chongqing to be uh, with uh, Chiang Kai-shek, who had set up his headquarters there and uh, they were looking for anyone who knew anything about China. By the end of 1942, John Fairbank was sent on a mission to Chongqing. A 35-year-old Harvard professor arriving as a civilian to work under the American Embassy distributing microfilm from the new China section of the Cultural Relations Division of the State Department while collecting Chinese publications for the Library of Congress. This was, as I announced to all and sundry, my respectable academic cover for my less publicized effort to win the war by finding and microfilming Japanese publications for use by the Office of Strategic Services in Washington. After a separation of seven years, the time for reunion came at last. Liang Sichung often took a small stream ferry packed with people to the wartime capital, Chongqing, to apply for small grants from the Ministry of Education to keep up his academic pursuits. These journeys along the Yangtze River took four days. In Chongqing, the two men who had become friends a decade earlier met once again. John Fairbank recalled that Liang was so excited that they shook hands for five minutes. The laughter and chatter from Dei Ping came back to life. Two months later, 
John Fairbank took the passenger ferry up from Chongqing to the village of Lijuang to meet the other dear friend from whom he had been separated for seven years, Lin Huiying. From the edge of the town, one walks on the narrow stone paths that circle the rice fields. From being in Sichuan, it gets more water than sunshine and is damp and dirty with the accumulation of years of wetness. This gives rise to the damp, ruinous smell which hangs over Sichuan like a cloud. Often there is a cloud layer all day and a rather lazy rain all night. Phyllis is very thin, but for the moment quite full of life and runs everything as usual by thinking about it before anyone else does. Meals occur by degrees, and after them we discuss things at length, she doing most of the talking. At night, after 5.30, one lives in candlelight, so that 8.30 gets to be bedtime. There is no telephone. There is a gramophone with some Beethoven and Mozart. There are thermos bottles, but no coffee. Plenty of woolen sweaters, but few that fit. Sheets, but not much soap for washing them. Pens and pencils, but not much paper to write on. Newspapers, but always several days old. John Fairbank stayed in Lijuang for a week and visited the several institutions of the Academia Sinica in Sichuan, meeting with old friends. He then spent almost one year traveling between Kunming and Chongqing to meet up with friends from Academia whom he had met a decade earlier in Beiping. He described in his memoirs what he saw of their living conditions. I was impressed by our friend's tenacity in continuing to function as scholars. Americans, I imagined, would have forsaken their books and turned to reconstructing their living conditions. But this highly trained Chinese community accepted the primitivism of peasant life and went on with their work. Starting in 1943, John and Wilma brought large amounts of vitamins and medicine through private channels. Wilma continually delivered necessities like fountain pens and wristwatches to the Kunming Consulate, which then secretly distributed them. John wrote in his memoirs, My private war had now emerged to help preserve the American educated Chinese professors, some of whom were old friends from Peking. In the archives at Harvard Yenching Institute, we found the following. In the beginning of 1943, John Fairbank repeatedly asked the board to deliver aid to the Chinese scholars. Dear Dr. Fairbank, I must thank you for yours of September the 30th, which came a few days ago, informing me of a grant of 1,000 US dollars. I am deeply touched and feel greatly honored by the offer of such a grant. My true appreciation could only be properly shown in my work in the coming year, which has been given such generous aid in advance. In 1943, the lives of Lin and Liang began to change. The weather is bitterly cold, but everyone is well, especially Phyllis, who is getting along and is making improved definitely. She is at present reading something about Granville Barker, who acted in the court theatre, Sloan Square, London, where Phyllis passed twice daily, going to a school and back, but never went in to see the place by Shaw and others. That was all 21 years ago, and she is regretting it still. This all shows how well she is. As to myself, I am as well as I can be, except for the chilblain on my ears, for which I have to have a pair of ear warmers made by tying a bundle of knitting wool around my ears, attracting the universal attention of little knights as I walked through the town. 
As work dragged along at the Institute, Liang spared no effort in recording the findings and painstaking work its members had performed over the course of many years. Meanwhile, I crawl along my usual routine in running this institute in snail fashion and in snail speed. The chief activity this year is to bring out two issues of a biannual publication, a crude version of our former quarterly. They are to be printed by the local lithograph printers. We are to draw everything and not to use any photographs at all. The Journal of the Institute for Research on Chinese Architecture published two special issues, compiled and printed in Lijuang with local lithographic technology. They were bound into volumes by hand and released as Issue 7, Part 1 and Part 2. Academic colleagues and various friends of the Institute gave generous financial assistance. Liang Suchung published an article in this issue called Why Study Chinese Architecture? The study of Chinese architecture, in a sense, goes against the prevailing trends of our time. During Chinese society has gone through enormous changes and tended toward westernization. Society in general has wreaked severe damage on existing architecture and the artistic works associated with it. Chinese architecture has persisted for more than 2,000 years and is a system of art. If we are to revitalize our country, then as we carefully arrange and preserve the historical relics of the many past dynasties, we cannot ignore the study of Chinese architecture. To do otherwise would be disrespectful to the glorious culture of the ancients. In the table of contents, we found a report by Liang Sicheng on the light of the Buddha temple in Wu Taishan, which had been postponed for seven years. Was this temple still standing after all these years of war? Liang Sicheng said that he hoped more than anything else that his pictures were not the only remaining record of the temple. The journal published an article by Lin Huiyin a reference work on modern residential design. In 1944, despite having been confined to her sickbed for so long, she took up materials John and Wilma had sent from abroad, wrote on the issue of building low-rent housing in post-war China. During the long period in Lijuang, some hope finally emerged for Liang to achieve his old dream of translating the mysterious book. After more than 10 years of survey and research, it now seemed possible. I plan to do translation work, taking classical Chinese that is hard to understand and converting it into more accessible language and annotating all the impenetrable words, jargon and names. Little did Liang Sicheng know that a Japanese scholar had already begun to decipher building standards. Japanese architect Tokuichi Takashima spent five years to finish his PhD thesis, a study of building standards. At the end of World War II, Japan was heavily bombed, and as he waited for his research to be printed, the two manuscripts were destroyed in a huge fire. In 1944, there was a glimmer of hope in the war. The Department of Education under the Nationalist government set up a committee for cultural relics in the war zone, appointing Liang Sicheng vice chairman. During this time, he was responsible for compiling a detailed list of all cultural relics in the war zone. All the names on this list were dear to the heart of this researcher. 
The list later became the basis for the inventory of all relics that were to be protected in the new China. Another important job for Liang was to compile a list of cultural relics in the North China and coastal regions for the 14th Air Force of the United States. These were marked on military maps so to as avoid destruction during the war. Liang earnestly gave the same designation to the old Japanese cities of Kyoto and Nara. These days, it might be hard to understand that during the worst of times with the war raging, a group of Chinese scholars persisted with their groundbreaking work. On the upper reaches of the Yangtze River, in the small town of Lijiang, scholars from the Institute of History and Philology created the academic masterpiece, assorted essays in the midst of poverty and illness. It covered topics in history, archaeology, literature, linguistics, ethnology, folklore, and anthropology. Most of these essays later became the building blocks of their respective disciplines, and almost scholars were leaders in their fields. <laughs> During this period of exile in the wilderness, their academic pursuits kept them alive. In 1945, five years after Liang and Lin came to Lijuang, we find in their letters a new kind of anticipation, full of hope. Dearest Wilma, we have just received the exciting telegram telling us that you are actually in New Delhi. The reality of such an event is hard to grasp at first, though we had talked of nothing else for these last ten years of your suddenly coming back to us. The children are so grown now that there are now four of the Liangs awaiting your arrival with equal intensity. Dear darling Wilma, a year ago this is D-Day. This year we received news that you would be in Chongqing by the 10th, and 10th is my birthday. When all this adds up, it means one thing. You are coming and we are in a celebrating mood. Dearest Aunt Wilma, I have got your dear letter. Both Mammy and I were so happy that we nearly shed tears. As you see, I'm learning to typewrite. I'm typing this letter myself instead of writing. This typewriter ribbon is given us by a man called John Fairbank. Perhaps you know him. He was a very nice man when he was here. Manny is still pretty and young, but she thinks that she is getting old and ugly. I often argue with her. I'm sure that when you come here, you will take my side. In May 1945, Wilma Fairbank came to Chongqing in the capacity of cultural attaché at the American Embassy. Ten years ago, on Christmas morning, 1935, Liang Sichong and Phyllis and Lao Jin were all at the Tiananmen Station to say goodbye to us as we left China. Last week, on the 3rd of July, 1945, Sichong was at the airport to welcome me back, as Lao Jin had already done in Kunming. One evening, soon after arriving in Chongqing, Wilma Fairbank was sitting at the doorstep of the embassy chatting with Liang Sichong and two young writers when suddenly... Suddenly he stopped talking. He and the others stiffened into a vigilant tenseness, almost like hunting dogs. I had to strain my ears to hear what they had heard. It was the faraway sound of a siren. Could it be an air raid? Preposterous, and yet each of them was alert for the possibility after years of conditioning to the real thing. 
Could it instead be signaling the victory? Very quickly, the news of victory spread like wildfire around the whole city. celebrating the victory was to ride a carrying chariot made of bamboo to the local tea house with Wilma by her side. Despite her six years in Lijuang, Lin Huiyin had hardly even reached the Lijuang County seat half a mile away. I went to town again by chair and took a boat punted by two of Taiping's boyfriend. I went to a restaurant for noodles and setting another tea house to get a rest and returning by way of the football field and watched a volleyball match from a tea shed, on the bank, etc. I also visited Taiping School the day before wearing slack and very elegant and caused a sensation. A poem they had taught their children during the hard times in Lijuang now appeared in front of their eyes. 见外呼传收寄北In December 1945, Wilma Fairbank arranged for Lin to leave Lichuang, where she had been living for five years, and go to Chongqing. Wilma took Lin around by jeep to watch movies, to see the school where her son was studying, and to dine in the mess hall of the American Embassy. There, she would excitingly engage in discussions with the Allies, and even take part in a meeting between the communists and the nationalists held at the news bureau of the embassy. The Leongs are here. Phyllis is out of her room in Lichuang for the first time in five years. She walked into our living room and gasped. It's just like walking into a magazine. For it is only in magazines that she has seen open fires and shaded lights in these last years. Everything is new and exciting to her, and she constantly keeps her eyes peeled for the new dresses and books and paintings, and all the sights of this to her great city of Chongqing. Unfortunately, all this doesn't mean that she is better. I took Dr. Eloesser to see her, a famous chest surgeon, and he told me that both lungs are involved, as well as the kidney, and that it is just a matter of a few years, perhaps five, before her brief but vivid life must come to an end. Still, she is full of vivacity and responsive to all facets of life and will probably be that way to the end. What 又什么时候，心才真能懂得这时间的距离，山河的年岁。